behind you yeah no. right very closely behind me <laughs> an integral part of all knowledge meets and summits and groups good evening padikar sir i am ratha kumar from kollam ആ നമസ്കാരം പിന്നെ പിന്നെ കണ്ടില്ലല്ലോ ഞാൻ പുറത്ത് സാധനം കൃഷിയൊക്കെ ചെയ്തിട്ടിരിക്കുകയായിരുന്നു ആ വേഷത്തിലാണ് നിൽക്കുന്നത് Uh, Walter, we have so many people who know German. <laughs> so, we, we all love German. German people and German language. <laughs> in fact, uh, who taught me uh, uh, German in University of California, Berkeley, was uh, Hans Albert Einstein, Einstein, Albert Einstein's eldest son. Oh, oh great. <laughs> great. <laughs> no, at that time, to get a phd you have to have a foreign language of course for us english <laughs> itself is a foreign language but that's not enough so they had to have a foreign language so i took german because my professor albert einstein was the examiner for it <laughs> <laughs> we have a german department in the university of kerala uh, yeah 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 we have by very very competent uh, teachers yes yes in fact my daughter took uh, german as her second language <laughs> Uh, let me say hi to Daresh and Unitan. Yeah, yeah. Hi, hi, sir. Ah. Yeah. 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 Hi. Daresh. Oh. Nice, 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 nice. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. nice to see you, sir. Nice to see you. Yeah. Retired yeah. and taking peaceful life for the past few months. Many, many years. 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 Many years.
a five-day workshop being conducted by Walter Danner on biogas. I told Alexander, what, at this age, you want me to learn biogas again? Then he said, no, I am attending. I want a company. Then I said, yes, I'll come. I went and attended the class. And in the first class itself, Walter Diner floored me in the sense he started the class with a simple question. Everywhere in India, in Africa, and in China, biogas plants fail. Why biogas plant is failing? This was the question he asked. And I think his journey with biogas research and innovations with uh, better high-performing biogas plants and totally eliminating failures in biogas plants and even advancing it far beyond what a biogas plant has been expected to do in the past. This has been a journey of doing, learning, improving the knowledge and spreading the knowledge, practicing it, again learning and again developing it further. So it was a continuous journey, I would say for 40 years. And in between, after his class, I remember having gone to Bavaria, rice back where he stays and spent few days with him and his family, seeing many of the plants he has actually built, whereas biogas plants directly connected to the grid. That was a new thing for me in the first decade part, middle part of the first decade of this century, to have to see those plants running without any problem. And the one pro plant which I saw, it had no operator, only a laptop there, and only one man going around, an engineer going around, in case if anything goes wrong, he will actually look at the laptop and set right things. But otherwise, everything was automated. Thereafter, of course, it was a long journey in Africa and in several other places. And in India also, we traveled together quite a lot and learned a lot of things about biogas plants and their relevance. So uh, I don't want to say anything more about uh, Diana, but you will uh, try to understand. Those who have not met him earlier, they will understand when you listen to his talk. Then uh, Katharina Diana. When I visited uh, Diana at his residence, she was actually a senior for his for her undergraduate courses. She became an engineer, now an MBA, and uh, she has actually advanced the biogas technology in much bigger way and taking up challenges uh, bigger than what Walter, myself, and Alexander Vergis and others took in several countries of Africa in the east, west, and sometimes somewhere close to north and sometimes close to south of Africa, many countries. She has actually gone straight, I think, first to Lake Victoria, which had a problem of around uh, roughly 10,000 hectares of um, what you call African pile or what we call the African weed, uh, Sylvania. Uh, this is a major problem for transportation, fishing, and uh, also uh, uh, very harmful to their economy too. And I think uh, doing a lot of experiments, trying a lot of projects, and finally coming up with a possible solution with that. And later, even connecting a grid-connected bioenergy plant has been built there as a model for many countries that can actually follow this pattern. And that has been, according to me, her contribution. 
And from there onwards, uh, I, as uh, Walter Donner himself says, she is a better expert than uh, Walter now in this subject. And therefore, uh, we are actually asking Katharina Donner to start the talk, which will be followed by Walter, uh, who will probably connect with his earlier work also along with it work on biochar with weeds and other things. So that is the thing. And uh, here again, I would like to listen to these people about their work and the way they solve it. And at the consultant network, I would say that how they have actually advanced consultancy with their research as well as their uh, implementation of projects. Head on going to a country or a region, taking the problem, taking it as a challenge, solving them, implementing those projects and showing results and coming back. This has been the nature of consultancy that they have been doing. So there is actually a lot of things that we have to learn. The picture of a consultant that we have in mind is totally different from the kind of high level academic or what you call innovative kind of work which Walter and Katharina and their team, because they have also a small team of uh, associates with them who are also trying to solve some other minor problems connected with the technology development and its implementation. So without adding much more, I would say that these are two great personalities who have agreed very happily to join us today and spend around one and a half to two hours with us interacting, initially talking and then interacting by clearing whatever doubts or whatever suggestions we have uh, on some of the things that they will be presenting. So thank you all and I don't want to stand between you and the talks. So may I request uh, uh, Ms. Katharina Dana to start her first presentation, which will be followed by Walter Dana's presentation. And then we will have uh, around half an hour of discussion. Please, whatever you want to get clarified, please put that in the chat box. Uh, then we will see that all of those things are taken and uh, answered together. Okay. Back again. I hope you hear me. Again, this is the. Do you hear me again? Yes. Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, apparently, this is the really bad internet in in Germany. We are like it's we are lacking here. So every everyone says. Um, I, I have the feeling every day the internet here is going slower and slower with all the home office and homeschooling and stuff. So, but then I start now. So, here we go. You should see my presentation now. Yeah. So. We're talking about high performing economic and sustainable biogas power from waste. And yeah, I just want to um, give you our latest uh, update on where we, uh, where we uh, had the, yeah, to see in the performance, but also in the economic sector and also in the sustainable sector of a biogas plant, what, what the advanced um, and the progress. Now, 
I just thought like we start um, why we should turn waste into biogas and we get um, as we get uh, requests from all over the world. We have uh, requests from India for rice straw, from Malaysia for palm oil, um, palm oil residues, from Israel for waste, um, from Ghana for from fruit uh, juice productions, um, Costa Rica or even Barbados. Um, so basically, waste is all but organic waste. You will you will find it everywhere. And everywhere, everyone has a problem with it. Um, they want to do electricity from it, or they just want to get rid of like the waste, the smell, and because it's all, all always also an environmental problem. So the requests we get, um, the reason why they want to do a project is quite different um, and has different motives. Um, some of them really want to get the fertilizer, uh, like for example in Malaysia, the electricity, the feed-in tariff for, for electricity is low, but what makes the project economic is because they have really high uh, costs for fertilizer, so there's a big fertilizer market where you can generate revenue from. Um, of course, it's about sustainability and closing circles, uh, nutrient circles, waste circles, and last but not least, it's also about profit because we see that this is often, even if there's a really good idea for project, um, yeah, funding and also that it's viable is, I mean, the go or no go decision if it goes than if a project is realized. Um, yeah, you, most of you know my father um, and we do buy gas since mid of the 90s. I just skip very briefly through this as most of you already know us that we have built quite a few, about uh, over 50 biogas plants basically everywhere worldwide. Um, we are quite spread over the whole globe because um, Walter likes to travel and likes to uh, experience new countries. Um, uh, yeah, we do some work in associations. Um, we've done something for UNIDO and she has sat. Um, this is just a small uh, overview where we've done projects it's not the latest I, I see. We've had some others as well. Um, yeah, and they were mostly built by guests, plants, did consulting works and so on. We do a small scale by guest plant from 10 kilowatt for off-grid uh, for off-grid applications. And this is all. This is in Africa as well. It's our biggest plant with 2.8 megawatt installed capacity, and it uses um, vegetable waste mainly um, from like baby corn straw and other and from peas and so on. Um, there's just another selection of different reference projects. Um, we build in the UK. Um, what's quite interesting, what we do as well, and what at the moment we do quite a lot, is the repowering of biogas plants. Like, because this is in Croatia, we are currently doing some in Germany as well, where there is an existing biogas plant. In this case, this was the existing biogas plant, and then we just built uh, up front on uh, hydrolysis tanks. And we double more than double capacity, and we're doing projects like this um, in Germany at the moment. But also, we're talking about projects um, where we in Malaysia. It's um, a project in preparation where we uh, where there is a palm oil mill uh, with a 
lagoon type plant for Pome and to add, to also be able to add fibers, the EFPs, we um, discussed to, to put two hydrolysis tanks up front. <clears throat> Same goes for <laughs> some island where they have um, lagoon type cassava um, bias plants and to add fibrous feedstock like rice straw or napier grass or, or fibrous feedstock, you can add um, uh, a retrofit uh, hydrolysis tank. And just shortly I show you why this is, why then you can um, digest this as well. Now, um, I thought the best thing is to, to structure the presentation a bit and to how about the progress made in the field of biogases to uh, structure into four um, factors. One is high performance factors, and of course, economy, uh, sustainability, and waste as a feedstock. Now, high performance factors. What we found out uh, in the last years, and especially in the last two, three years, um, is there are a few basic things that have to be right when your biogas plant is performing. Most of you know that we have, in Germany, we have now around 11,000 biogas plants. Most of them are now, let's say, roughly 10 plus years old. And in the last two to three years, we've done quite a few projects on consulting um, biogas plants here in Germany, which do not perform well. And where we consult them on how they can perform well. And what we found out is that mostly the biogas plant, or not mostly, but always, if a biogas plant does not perform well, it is due to a lack in one of those factors. And those are, one of the thing is, you need to have a high organic loading rate. Um, of course, if I write up to 60 kilogram volatile solids, this is for if you have a hydrolysis, but even if you have a single stage plant, um, we see that if you, feed with a higher loading rate and you feed not like every half an hour, but if you feed like just twice a day, um, but more volume, then the performance um, rises. Same as with temperature. Um, we see that plus 60 degrees temperature, especially for the hydrolysis, is the way to go. And even with digesters, even with single stage plants, you need to, the higher the temperature, the better, uh, the better the performance. So what we advise our um, customers where we do consulting is to first rise their temperature, not doing like 40, 42 degrees, but rising at least above, above 50 in the digester. And we see that also with this, you get more biogas out and you have less, uh, you don't need to mix so much. So you save energy on mixing and so on. Another important factor, which is, is trace elements. So you need, this is the, as you need, it's the most basic requirement. If you want to have a biogas plant who, that is performing who has a high performance and you need to have a sufficient trace element supply. Um, we see this very, very often. And one of the things we usually advise is that check your trace elements first. If, it, if temperature is okay and if everything seems okay, do an analyst, analysis of trace elements. And usually it is this. And we even have um, one, we have one, we had one plant where the biogas operator said, yeah, but it cannot be the trace elements. You know, uh, 
about 35% of my feedstock is cow manure. And I'm feeding trace elements to my cow. So there should be enough in the manure. There should be enough trace elements in the manure. And then we did a trace element analysis. And then it showed, oh, that one of the trace elements was missing or the, the level was too low. And then he fed, he fed those trace elements as a supplement. And then he, immediately his biogas uh, level rose, even if he, di he didn't feed more, but the production just rose. And another thing is CN ratio, which is especially important when you do when you have a lot of straw and very fibrous feedstock with a lot of uh, a lot of C in it, a lot of carbon. Then you really have to make sure that you have nitrogen source as well. Um, I'm mentioning this here especially because we just have a request from India for 100% rice straw where we said like, okay, you need to have some nitrogen source somewhere because otherwise your bacteria cannot work because they, they need it for their, um, for, for their biology. And we saw that if you have those four factors right, then there's basically no, uh, there's no obstacle. You, your biogas your bi will just perform, your biogas plant will just have the output. And then the next question is usually when we say to our biogas operators, okay, you have done this, you have, you have a, the loading rate is okay, your, new, your trace elements level is okay, your temperature level is okay, the CN ratio is okay. Yeah, but how do I measure, um, how do I know that I have enough or sufficient uh, biogas? How do I know that my biological performance is good? And this is really easy with one key number. You just have to calculate your cubic meter of methane per ton of volatile solid. And if you do this on a regular level, you immediately, immediately see how your, bio, uh, how your biology is performing and if it's doing well or if it's struggling to get the biogas out. Um, and then just a bit on the biological performance basics. Usually I tell, people that they have to think of their biogas bacteria as their workforce. And if you want to have your workforce, your staff um, working well, you have to treat them right. You have to make them an environment which they like. If it's really hot, you install air conditioning so your workers uh, can work. If it's really cold, like here in Germany, we, ha we have to install heating so um, my people in my office can work. Otherwise, they're freezing and they cannot work. And the same is with the biogas bacteria. And we often see that especially when it comes to biological conditions, uh, even biogas operators who have uh, biogas plants for 10 years now, don't think about uh, this, that they have to make a right environment for the biogas bacteria which, where they feel right. And one thing is that you have to feed them the right feedstock. So, or the other way around, what do you want? So if you have low fibrous feedstock, then you, this is for cows, like if you have maize or starch or stuff like this. If you want to have high fiber, feed high fibrous feedstock like grass, like straw, you usually feed to a cow. Now, a single stage biogas plant is like a pig stomach. There's just one stomach where all the biological processes take place. And then when you think of it, what you feed to, to pigs is like potatoes, um, like all starch, very easy stuff. You would never feed grass 
to pick. So usually this high energy feedstock is also expensive because it, it's usually also what humans eat. So what's really important is that two pigs do not equal one cow. What I mean is sometimes people say, oh, we have more stages, but then if you have like two digesters or a, or a digester and a post digester, you just have two pigs because in both uh, tanks, exactly the same biological processes are taking place. Now, the difference is a cow's digestion system. As you know, the cow's digestion system is not one stomach, but it's four stomachs. And in each one, in each stage of the digestion system, something different happens. And this is why a cow can eat grass, why a cow can digest low energy feedstock, which is usually also the cheap one because uh, humans, we, we cannot eat it. So there's uh, no competition. And this is why we have this two stage uh, biogas plant with an upstream hydrolysis. And the batch hydrolysis tank is a front end preparation, which is, it equals and which is mimicking the pound of the cattle. And as I said before, and this is what we do with a retrofit at the moment in, in some plants. Um, why do we do this? Is because, first of all, we have batch feeding with the hydrolysis. And this is, you get a really high organic loading rate. And this is really boosts your, um, your performance and your biogas output. And with that, you can also degrade all the cellulose and the hemicellulose in the fibrous feedstock. And with that, you get more, more and higher biogas yield. Now, when you can degrade the cellulose and the hemicellulose in even part of the lignin structure, it opens up another, um, another area and another field of feedstock because now you can digest vast amount of straw, maize stalks, um, EFBs like uh, from, palm, from, from palm oil production and so on. And on the other hand, you can also digest quite energy rich materials such as, such as slaughterhouse waste because it's in a different tank. Then, as the motor run said before, it makes the operation really easy and simple. So it is very usual that if you go to one of our biogas plants with a hydrolysis, you will not see anyone. There's no one there because it can be monitored from uh, a remote uh, laptop or even the, they have it on their iPhone. They can look at their iPhone and then they see, oh, okay, uh, everything is all right. And they get a notification if, from the control system and then they go there and uh, see if, if something happens. But um, just normal, it, you won't find anyone there. So they go once a day or twice a day to check, to have a visual check, but that's it. And because it's so easy to control, you have really high full load hours. And what is really important for us that we use high quality equipment because we see uh, this is one of the main things for profitability as well. I come to this later. Yeah, just here the basic layout uh, of, of a two stage plant. We have the hydrolysis one and hydrolysis two. As said, it's a batch process, so we feed then it stays here for one to two days and then it's fed to the digester. Meanwhile, hydrolysis two is fed and also can uh, then the hydrolysis and acidification takes place. And here in the hydrolysis tanks, different 
uh, biological process take place compared to the digester. Now, this is what I said before. It's not, this is not three pigs, but this is one cow's digestion system. Yeah, just the same again, but in reality, this is a plant in the UK. So you have here the two hydrolysis tanks the digester and the final storage, which is, in India, this would be quite a lot smaller, but here with winter in, in Europe, we need uh, quite a lot of storage for winter times because you cannot bring it, uh, the digestate out. Now, second factor, economic factors. What we've seen is that the feedstock for OPEX we, or I, I place OPEX at the very, very top because usually when you go to investors, so usually someone requests, we, uh, we, we get an email request and then they say, yeah, this is what we want to do. And then they say, can you give us a quote for this buy this plant? And then we send our quote with our CapEx and then they say, say you're too expensive. Uh, we have a competitor which is a lot cheaper than you. And then we say, okay, um, what is the performance of this competitor? What do they really, uh, what do they quote for? And then we see, oh my God, this their performance is a lot lower. So usually, like every investor that we've met so far, they decide on CapEx. What they don't think of is that what really brings their profit and what really has influence on, their, on the profitability of the project is the OPEX. Because if you have a project going up, if you have a biogas plant which runs for 20, 25, even 30 years, it's the OPEX which really is heavy on your profit. And we see this, this is an experience we now have in Germany. It's like those, those biodiesel plants, which are, were built 2005, 2006, 2010, 2011, are now 10, 11, 12, 15 years old. And the ones which build really cheap have, have to spend so much money on electricity, on, uh, on maintenance, they don't get out the, uh, the biogas anymore and so on. Those who build good plants, they, after 10 years, easily can reach their, uh, their performance and their OPEX costs still are okay. And this is where we say, okay, what well, you really have to look at, especially, it depends a bit on the, or, one of the biggest OPEX costs is your feedstock cost. And this depends, of course, on what do you have as a feedstock. Therefore, it's really important how much cost do you have per cubic meter of, of methane. And this also includes transport costs and um, disposal costs of, of digestate. And the second thing is your parasitic load, because um, this is what I said before, if, if you, for example, if you have high temperatures and you can reduce your mixing time, you save on parasitic load. Of course, if your biology is really thick and it doesn't degrade uh, really good and you have like the digestate is thick, you also can install a bigger mixer or mix more. But usually this just means more cost. And the second thing is revenues. This is also a thing we've experienced in the, in the last few years is that fertilizer is becoming more and more important and that they, almost everywhere in the world where we get requests, uh, fertilizer becomes um, something which you can actually sell. Sometimes you have to create a market, or not you have to create a market. The market is there, but you have to create a product and sell it. This is, of, of course, one thing. But um, as 
uh, soil gets more depleted, this becomes a real hot topic. And Walter will, uh, will tell you more about the, the soil and fertilizer topic in his presentation. Yeah, and of course, CapEx is there as well when it comes to economic factors, but as said, it's not the number one. Um, just to stress on the cost per cubic meter, it's the cheapest feedstock is which gives you the most CH4 at the lowest cost per cubic meter. So even if you think, okay, ah, this feedstock is really, is really cheap when you don't get a lot of CH4 out of it, it's not really worthwhile. Same for CAPEX, you have to look at the lifetime costs, not only at the pure uh, sum of a CAPEX. And as we have a, a small overview where we say, okay, um, it's a bit small, but I hope you can read it. And if you want to have it, we can send it to you. Uh, where we see, okay, why OPEX beats CAPEX. Um, and one, of course, what we all know, if you build cheap, you build twice. But what is even more important is the second factor. And this is something um, most people do not have in mind, that standstill is the most expensive thing which can happen at a biogas plant. So they build low quality and then um, the plant is down because they have to do a lot of repair, a lot of maintenance. And a biogas plant is something which runs 24 seven, 8,760 hours a year. Now, if you have to stop your biogas plant constantly because a mixer fails, a pump fails, uh, your biogas roof is not, not properly fixed, whatever, then you have standstill. And this is, depending on what you get as a feed interior, this is really a lot of cost. So um, when, you have a, when you have a megawatt plant and you get only like 10, 10 uh, cents per kilowatt hour, which is really a low feed-in tariff. This means per day you lose 2,400 euro. So, I mean, and then over the years, this is a lot of money if you do not invest in proper technology. And the third uh, point here is equipment determines commitment. What we've seen is that sometimes investors build, build biogas plants. I can't, if I come to a biogas plant and then um, I, I once came to a biogas plant and it was a really high tank and there was the, the uh, window for the tank was quite high up. I think it was like seven, eight meters up there. And we usually say, okay, to the operator, he should have a look into the tank each day because on how the, as I said before, your bacteria is your workforce. It's a bit like a farmer with his animals. So have a look into your, in the tank, see how your bacteria is doing, see how the bubbles are bubbling. And you will have, you will have a feeling, the biogas operator has a feeling if everything is right or if it's wrong. It's a bit like if a farmer has a cow and he looks at the cow every day and then he thinks like, it doesn't look the same as yesterday. Perhaps it's a bit sick. And the same is with your bacteria when you look at it every day. And then I came to this biogas plant and the window was really up high and there weren't, there weren't stairs there was a ladder and this was in Germany by the way and I was quite cold and I was like okay never ever is the operator going up these six meter stairs every day 
at like five degrees or zero degrees outside. I mean, the same will happen if you have like 40 degrees outside, the operator will not, not climb the ladder every day or even twice. So equipment determines commitment. This means you have to have comfortable equipment for your operator. It has to be easy for them to check. If you make it really hard and they will not check it properly. And the best operator is the one which, which operates the plant on like very side floor, which sees the problems coming before, the, before they come and takes action. But he only can do that if he does the daily checks. And he will do the daily checks if it's easy for him to do it. Um, sustainability. It's, this is more about because it's something which drives us. It's, this is why we do biogas, because we think it's one big part of um, to make the world more sustainable. Um, one thing is CH4, which is with, with the biogas, we do avoid so much CH4, which is 87 times more harmful to the climate than CO2. And this becomes more and more of a topic that CH4 is the thing where we have to have a look at. Then of course it does replace fossil fuels and it's a 24 seven renewable energy. So this is especially here in Germany where we do not have so much sun, but also um, it can um, balance out um, solar PV or wind um, renewable energy. And then just to get also to waste as a feedstock, um, we usually say we don't like the word waste. This is, we say it's agricultural or industrial byproducts because what is sustainability is about closing cycles. And if you have a cycle, you don't have a waste. It's always your waste of the one is the product for the next one. So um, when you have a waste, you have to think, we think you have to think of, okay, how can I use this? And this is just an example of one plant. There's a plant in the UK and this plant has a whole variety of different feedstock. And what's really uh, funny is that these pictures, Walter took all those pictures on one day. So it was not that they feed it like over the year, but they had all this feedstock there. So you had from old potatoes, vegetable waste, chicken manure, cattle manure, even pure straw. And yeah, just to see, this is an example in Croatia um, where they have a, also a great variety from restaurant waste, brewery yeast, slaughterhouse waste, blood, but also maize. So they have a mixture of wastes coming from agriculture or industrial um, applications, but also um, energy crops. And they have quite a lot of energy rich, rich feedstock. Yeah, this is just a feedstock list. It's not, it's a selection. So there's a lot of more, which basically almost anything which rots can be um, degraded in the biogas plant. So food, blood, um, MSW, of course, and so on. And to see if you have a two-stage biology. So for the one-stage biology, usually you, the easy stuff like slurry, maize silage, and so on, is easy to digest. If you have a two-stage biology, as said before, you can do the fiber stuff on the one hand, but you can also do the very energy-rich stuff because with the hydrolysis, you have like a buffer and the risk of overfeeding and of 
uh, acidification in the digester is uh, minimized or even totally prevented. Yeah, and then I want to show you just a bit of our biogas plants that we built. Um, this is the one we has, have seen uh, at the beginning in, at the flower farm or vegetable and flower farm in Kenya. So we build it to German standard um, because I've been to a biogas plant in Tanzania before we've built that. And the plant was about two years old and I saw pictures of the inauguration. And then I saw the real plant that was like, wow, this looks like it has been there for like 20 years. Like everything was faded and corroded. And then we said, okay, if we want to be sure that the biogas plant in such an environment where there's a lot of sun um, and so on, we have to make sure that it's really good quality. Otherwise, it will just degrade a lot sooner and will not work anymore. Yeah. There you see the, the hydrolysis. This is like stairs to go up and have a look. So that is really easy, what I said before for the operator. Then the control system where basic all the uh, control and monitoring can be done and um, can be done automatically. And there you see like the pumps, the control system, which we usually do prefabricate so that the welding on construction site is um, reduced to a minimum because it's a lot easier to weld in the workshop than on site. This is the room where the, the pumps are. And for India, where what we, uh, yeah, just our experiences where there's like up to 100% rice straw, also for biogas and CNG. And then you could use the biogas for tea drying instead of firewood, which is more economical then. And if what we've done is we did a guide um, on how to assess a biogas project's viability in 10 minutes with only seven questions so that it's easy for someone to check boxes if it's a viable project or if it's just a nice idea. Um, if you want to have this, you can just send me an email and I, I send it to you. Yes, that's it. I hope uh, it was interesting and you learn some new things and um, we can have a look at the questions yeah oh, katarina i think <laughs> I get uh, walter also to speak and then we will have a joint discussion okay so, yeah so we can do this okay that. perfect so then i said i i okay i have to just yeah. see how yeah. it Ah, no. Okay, so I can. Yes, uh, one. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, how does this work now? One moment. Oh, yes. Now, uh, thank you very much. And then. Uh, I have so many friends in Kerala, as you saw. <laughs> I've been there so many times with WKT and Alex, and uh, maybe everything was organized, let's say, just initiated by Alex, and uh, a lot of it was facilitated by Darishan. And uh, Darishan, B and WKT, we were even in the Maldives, Lakshadivs. Hey, this was my one, yeah, one of the best times of my life. And uh, Katarina uh, uh, just introduced uh, how to say the biology or the, the biogas plant that I want to uh, get a step further because normally we think about, let's say, a linear agriculture or uh, byproducts or manure, biogas, fertilizer. And 
the last years, we I investigated in other things, and this is one thing is biochar. So, uh, yeah, and uh, how to boost biogas in agriculture with biogas? Agriculture is now the main point. And when we boost agriculture, then we boost biogas as well, because uh, we get more, uh, how to say, more feedstock to feed. Normally, you go there and think, OK, you plant a seed. And uh, not the next day, but a few days later or a few weeks later, for India, it's much faster than for Europe. and. Uh, everything grows and uh, this was one thing and but the reality now is uh, it's growing less even they feed more fertilizer and uh, they need more pesticides and everything the, the farmers struggle more and more to get out more uh, from the same hectare, but the other way around, they go, they go back. The yields decrease. Soil degradation is one thing, and we uh, I talk about this then, and then in the structure, and then biochar. What is biochar? What is the the key? What are the key factors? What is our experience as SLP and biogas and biochar? Yes, the situation is that we have less, uh, how to say, lower yields than 10 years ago. Even if we have better seeds, maybe we have uh, irrigation is improved but especially in tropical soils like India, there was always the humus content very low. The reason is the higher temperature than we have uh, here in Europe. Let's say with the higher temperatures in the winter, we build up humus. So I dare to say farming in Europe is much easier in farming in India. But the people, they think always it's the other way around. But to destroy the soil fertility in India is much easier than in Europe, based on the climate. Maybe this is not uh, the topic for the uh, electrical mechanical engineers, but it's part of the whole system. And uh, with the, then they saw the solution in the, in the artificial nitrogen. And with the adding of the nitrogen, so even the, the leftover humus, the, this is the, the, the carbon, and uh, let's say was degraded very easily. And with more uh, irrigation, even proper irrigation, it's faster. I was in Futera. Futera is in the United uh, Arab Emirates, one of these four Emirates, and then in a resort. And then I saw every day the, the gardener watering and the flowers. And I asked him, yeah, how many times do you add in fertilizer? And which fertilizer is it? Yeah, compost every four to six weeks. And watering every day in the morning. So four to six weeks means if we apply compost in Germany, it just uh, gives the fertility uh, within 12 months up to 24 months. But with this temperature and the water, four to six weeks. So they buy every four to six weeks compost coming from India because they don't produce compost in the Emirates or in the Middle East. 
And then another thing is just to see it. Uh, the Green Revolution, they tried to change this. They said, oh, it's going down, more and more people. And in, there are the numbers in uh, Africa available. <coughs> we then there's this Agra, a Green Revolution. And when you see the, before the Agra, they had 100 million uh, starving people. Now they have one more starving people. And you can say, okay, there is uh, more population and everything, but when you get many experts on the ground and they produce more uh, starving people, there's something wrong in the whole thing. But what they did is they forced the farmers to use artificial fertilizer, pesticide and hybrid seeds. So uh, I think, and in India, you hear similar stories. And everything is about this. So they reduce the fertility of the soils. And there is just a loop going down step by step. And we have to change it. And now the, the change is biochar. And uh, biochar is nothing else than charcoal. Everyone who does a barbecue uses charcoal. And uh, you see it here and here. And the big problem is always, okay, from where to take the charcoal, cutting forests down for the wood to produce charcoal for the fields. This doesn't work. And so what we do is, in our case, we produce it from water hyacinth, and uh, I think uh, as uh, Riccati mentioned, the term African wheat. What in the intro? Uh, what was totally new to me, and mentioned Salvinia. I think he refers to Salvinia molesta is a water fern. We are. And this is, this is something which is a weed. And water hyacinth, I saw the water hyacinth in the backwaters of uh, Kerala. As long as there is, uh, uh, how to say, uh, sweet water, they grow. And there's a lot of, and then when there is salt water in it, they die. This is what we do. And biochar you can make from wheat and agricultural byproduct from straw, everything. And then you see, and it, we use it as a soil enhancer. This picture here is from a uh, garden near, uh, near Berlin. The sandy soils, very low fertility, uh, very low uh, humus content and very low water holding capacity. But then you see, we gave this to gardener and under this cabbage is uh, biochar. Under this two and here, this row is biochar. This is same, just as intro, what can be the effect and I give more the uh, results and more numbers. So, uh, biochar is a set, uh, a carbon and minerals and you see it a very porous structure. It's like a sponge. And this spongy structure is the key to uh, higher fertility to higher uh, yields, to food security, and to prosperity, especially what our intention is for the smallholder farmer. And then when, is, when I talk about the surface, one teaspoon 
of this biochar has an inner surface of uh, of a tennis court, even say of a football field, depends on the quality. Can you imagine how huge the surface is when you add this to the soil? And the effect is on the on the surface, it has a strong absorption forces. It has negative charge and takes the positive ions. And uh, it binds the, the nutrients, especially the, the ammonia. So when you add this to chicken manure, there's no more smell because is the whole nutrients are really hold by this, uh, how to say, is a physical process by the absorption. And when you imagine you have a football field of surface, how many molecules or how many atoms can be attached to. And the same with water, it binds uh, a lot of water is two to five times of its own weight. I did my own experiments. Uh, I took the, uh, the one kilogram of uh, biochar and watered it completely, sucked it with water, put it to a sieve, let the water go, and then I took the weight. And then I gave it in my oven. Is a gas oven where I can baking normal kitchen oven, and then I uh, evaporated out the whole water, and back was left the the biochar. And when then I saw this special biochar I had, I produced by myself in my garden, could hold 2.7 times of water, and this is very important for countries which has, uh, let's say, a monsoon and then a drought season or a dry season. So in this case, the biochar can start a virtuous circle of better yields, better soils, saving a lot of water, especially irrigation water. When you have it in the soil, the normal temperature can't evaporate the water from the char. An oven can do it because it's uh, 200 degrees, but not the normal temperature outside. So the water, which comes from the rain, is kept in the soil for the plants. Yes. And then this is, this is uh, you can improve nutrition and local prosperity. This is just for the people themselves. And this is climate, you can fix the carbon humus formation and, and such things. And now, results with biochar in Ghana, in a tropical country. And uh, this is not done by myself, but by my friend Felix from Switzerland. He's doing it now for more than 10 years. This is an, uh, a result of uh, 2013. This is the control without biochar and fertilizer means this is biochar loaded with compost and uh, chicken manure. And this is the, the normal thing, how they, they give normal fertilizer and this is how it works. And the maize yield increases fourfold and this is not a dream uh, result. It's, uh, there was done research, a PhD research from Germany, from the Technical University of Berlin. The lady, she did all the investigations and in the thesis, this is published, you can read it, four, four times yield increase. Can, and, uh, and with, more or less no additional costs. 
And uh, the, the biochar is no fertilizer. It's a soil enhancer. And then another field is white jute. They eat it and then you have seven times increase of the yield. This is from 2018. Everything is in Northern Ghana. Roselle is a kind of spinach. This is 1,600 yield increase. It uh, sounds dramatic, but here, why it is so high is, so they, they see it here and then they cut it and nothing comes again. But Roselle is a, a spinach you can cut up to 10 times. They cut it here three times and it comes back and it comes back and comes back three times, not the 10 times. After three months, they just add it up and had a 1600% yield increase. So every rupee you invest in this gives you as farmer 16 rupees back after three to four months. And it's no fake. This is really numbers which are available. I have pictures from, I don't know, ground nuts, uh, peanuts, where you see it, how much more peanuts are, uh, let's say, peanut plant on a plot because the, with the biochar in the soil, there is enough water that more plants can survive. So, and this is not only ours, there are so many biogas results worldwide available. It's already more than 2000 biogas results. I think you, it's not necessary to go into the system. And what really amazing is, is uh, in, uh, in Nepal, in uh, North India, let's say it's nearly the same as in Nepal from the, from the climate condition. So the, uh, the, the pumpkins grow uh, for, uh, 400%. The tea plantations give much better yield. And when you have a dry area, when you give, want to reforest, and you give to the seedling, let's say a handful of uh, loaded wet biochar, let's say you increase the surviving rate from 30, 40% up to 90%. This is in Germany, for instance, we have now problems with the trees in the cities because it's so hot, not enough water. What we are doing now is so we drill a hole there, filled with biochar, loaded biochar, and the water, the normal rainwater is kept by the biochar and the, the trees in the city survive. And we have a really dramatic situation. Last year, between 6,000 and 7,000 trees in the city of Frankfurt died due to water stress, to heat stress. It's not India alone, it's, it's in our case too. And you see here an example, maize or here, sweet pepper 79, which are cash crops. In rice, I have, uh, there are very good uh, results and research results on rice. And uh, this one in Indonesia, 90% increase of rice here, up here, 70, 73. Not everything is, so in Italy is 36% more. This is uh, China, 40% more. And what we see, I can, can send you, um, uh, let's say some publications if you're interested. So you stabilize the rice production means it's not going up and down. It's just going slightly variation within the years. So the farmers are not faced higher yields when the weather is good and low uh, and lower yields when the weather is not so 
uh, favorable. No, no, it's the same. And the, the economic um, effect on using the, uh, how to say, the nitrogen, even if it is artificial nitrogen, is much better with the water hyacinth. So, ah, water hyacinth is the biochar. The, the cost for the farmers come down. Yeah, this is tomato, 170% or cabbage, 750. I guess it's a game changer. This is now clear. In agriculture, horticulture, in biodiversity, food security, and prosperity creation. The, there, there's always a, was always a critical situation, or the critics in Germany say, you can't cut down the trees to produce biochar for the fields. Yes, this is not, this is not uh, advised. So India lost a lot of uh, tree cover and everything, but you can make it from every uh, weed. Most important is it's dry. And then how to make biochar? This one, oh, sorry. This one, this is our uh, research in Germany, and we have it now mobile. What we use, uh, water hyacinth, salvinia molesta, we use tree cuttings, bush cuttings, we use uh, dry digestate from biogas plant, or in this case, the, these trees, the spruce, were infected by bugs. They were dead, dead trees. So hectares and hectares by the higher temperatures, uh, what we have now. This is one thing. And so everything, what is available you can use in, I know from a friend, he's from near Chennai. He told me that they uh, produce it from this uh, shrub with a lot of thorns. And uh, so, and they sell it to Bhutan because the, they buy it for some, um, how to say, Cecil coal production. But here in, uh, in Africa, when they produce the charcoal, this dust is left and no one uses it. Alex, can you remember in Tanga and Wikidee, we saw it, they make briquettes again. But Julie instead Flora? of, yeah, uh huh? Flora, I think. Yes, this, this is this is northern, northern Ghana. This is a dust from briquette making. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you, we saw it in Tanga in Tanzania. One of our trips, similarly, this and then you can use this charcoal dust to use it uh, to use for a soil enhancer. So I always say no charcoal from fresh wood. This is this is a no go. This is the reason why we started just by, how to say, chance. I was asked from water hyacinth in Ethiopia, you see, we harvest it. Harvest is the wrong word, because with harvest, you always think you have a seed, you have a field, you have a cultivation. But it's more, let's like, say, like weeding. Then we dry it and we carbonize it. And this is the carbonizer we developed for this. And you see, how it is from the water hyacinth to, to carbon. And the intention is for me to open your eyes that there is everywhere is some mm, uh, biomass available. And when it is dry, as we saw it here, then you can make biochar. And this is say this Fresh water hyacinth has a dry matter content of seven to ten percent. Alex and Wicked we saw this in Kisumu floating. Can you remember? Very much, yeah. Yes. And then this is what we saw, but no one how we did it and did it. And I had no idea how we can do it. We talked about using it in Huma Bay. We in our biogas plant we built together in uh at this. There was not the time and everything. So we use slaughterhouse waste finally, but this is 
This is now 90% dry matter, sun drying. Yeah. And these are people who are doing it. They have an income of, let's say, $20, $20 per month or having nothing, or $30 per month or having nothing. Because they are unemployed, use, it's better to do this. That's it. And it looks like this. This is the, the system we developed here is from Mason uh, with uh, bricks. And then we use, this is uh, wood, which from trees, which were killed by beetles. This is their job. It's the bark beetle. Bark beetles go there, eat inside of the bark, replicate, fly to the next tree and eat again. And a lot of trees die hectares and hectares, and no one knows what to do. So we produce the biochar. And this is now the system we have uh, in a mobile version, because this one to get uh, 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 operation permission in Germany is nearly impossible. And uh, this one, we, the next one is ready, uh, is ready next week. So we can operate its functions like the same uh, principle as this upper one. But, and then from biochar, we go the next step when it is produced. Then when we add it to the, to the soil from the normal, let's say here, yellow or clay soil, it goes there, it becomes black over the years. So terra preta means uh, when you add this, then you get terra preta. Preta means soil, terra is black. Black soil in Portuguese language. Because this was found in the Amazonian forest first, but now we saw, see it in Sierra, Lo Sierra Leone. In uh, Ghana, they have it, uh, not Ghana, uh, Liberia, maybe Ghana, and uh, some parts of Ethiopia, they still use this. It's not an, a new thing. Uh, they have it in, it's in Europe, it's forgotten. What I see, is, I think this was done uh, in India 500, 1000 years ago too. And uh, when you add the biochar to the soil, it keeps its function for 1000 years and longer because the, the char is inert. It just works as a, how to say, a spellenser for the water and the nutrients. And that's it. It's not uh, a natural soil. It's an anthropogenic, fertile soil. It's man-made. And what we do now, uh, we, we make this soil. Only when you uh, add 10 tons of biochar in a hectare, this is sufficient for the next 2,000 years. And it's too expensive. When you add, let's say, one or two uh, tons per hectare and add it the next year, is already a good start. But most important is when you have the biochar, you have to load it with nutrients. First, mix it with, in this case, Ultramania. This is from Nigeria, from this is our project from Nigeria and uh, or with compost, you can just spread it or you can give it to single plants, it's possible too, or with pots. Uh, we do backyard gardening, this is from Lagos, uh, near Lagos airport. You can see even here, there's a channel, concrete channel. Here he is growing with the, with the biochar outside of his, uh, fence of his plot where his house is. Uh, this is uh, cucumber and, and different things, tomatoes and everything. And he is only, uh, let's say, he got one ton of biochar only. With one ton of biochar, he's growing all his fruits. And from uh, our calculation in Germany, 
we did, I did, we did a calculation in a very small garden with 50 square meter only, we harvest around 440 to 450 kilogram of uh, vegetables in one season. But in Nigeria, we have three seasons. We calculated then having only two seasons and multiplied with the price on the market, see with 40, 50 square meters and the biochar, a family can make the whole income for a year. It's not the, the high level income, no. It's the income of the people who only know other job or even when a family at home, they have a, a small plot, a garden, and then they can grow so much and it's not an eight hours job per day by a lawyer and comes home in the evening, he's taking care of the garden, not his wife is doing it. He's a lawyer traveling in a lot. He's a quite successful uh, uh, lawyer, Arantiok is his name. Yeah. And um, this, is, this is the way we want to go. And in this case, you remove CO2 from the air and fix it for more than 1000 years. You, with the humus, what you uh, produce, let's say when you give to the depleted soils, the, the biochar, a lot of microorganisms grow around and take a lot of CO2 from the air. The same is you need less artificial fertilizer, means less fossil gas to produce, less pesticides, less uh, fossil fuel. This is negative emissions. So this is one point what we do, we reduce it. And what we did is, Katarina and me, we organized within one year from May 20 to May 21. Uh, we sequestered, or let's say avoided 15,900 tons of CO2s. When you say this is uh, in the German way, 15,900, divided by two persons is 7,950. And we, we have a footprint of 90. So each of us has, a, has a compensated his carbon footprint for the next 722 years. When we take our families, it's more than 100. And then this is, this is, uh, this is possible. Yeah, and the sustainable development goals. Yeah, what we do is how we finance it with the certificates because we are not rich enough to finance everything. So, and uh, then to go back to biogas, as you have a, a huge surface of the nutrients, you, are, uh, you have special advantages. When you have a lot of slaughterhouse waste, a lot of uh, chicken waste. And that no one wants to add a lot of water because this increases the volume of your tanks and everything. So adding the biochar, it binds the nutrients, it binds the nitrogen, it binds the ammonia. So in this case, with smaller biogas plants, a higher uh, let's say percentage of of uh, poultry up to up to 100% poultry menu is possible. So you can run your biogas plant. And uh, this is this is another thing which is coming in Germany. And but in Germany the the biochar is quite expensive because everyone wants to do it without having any work. So you need huge investment. And the investment is here with the smallest unit, 1 million euro. But what you saw, my development is the smallest unit, what we use 
from the old, old, uh, old oil drums uh, is $30 per kiln. So I started with $30 in my garden. I developed it. And then the other one, what you saw is just, this is 5% of the normal investment is 50,000 euro. So it, it's a, a, a fast payback. So we have just with this game changer in the biology and everything, I developed now a game changer in the costs of producing biochar. This was my aim. This was my aim. So I thank you. Yeah, that's it. We are now, you saw this, Katarina and me, and you saw this. Yeah. Oh, two pillars. We do this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and this is always what we deliver our project from the idea to the business. We don't stop with paperwork. And uh, as uh, VKD knows that uh, I hate paperwork and VKD was my best support to finalize all the UNIDO assignments that, I, that Alex or his staff could transfer the money because he wrote, uh, he wrote most of the reports. Otherwise, I'm sitting here as a poor and broke man. <laughs> because, you know, WKD, he's just, uh, uh, how to say, an artist. And the sentence flow out of his pen or of his typewriter. And when I write one sentence, uh, WKD, who has already finished the whole chapter or a whole page. So VKD, thanks for this. And uh, now uh, I'm, I'm ready for question if you have some. Yes, yes. Uh, now, Mr. Soher. Soher, uh, please take moment. over the question. Mm -hmm. So here, unmute, so here. Yeah. Okay, okay, I'm here. Um, question, we are starting the question answer session now. So we are welcome. It's a very, very interesting topic. It's a lot of practical applications. I was amazed by the talk and its practical applications. It's re really great for Kerala. And I'm, so, I'm also sorry that many, many of our young people could, couldn't participate in this uh, session, which would have really induced them to do very creative works. So the German thinking, how we can practically adopt things to transform the country or the world. It was evident from the, every word of uh, the speaker. So we really appreciate this talk and I, I'm sure we want to formulate some program that we can try and benefit from this idea. I never heard of biochar. So this is a quite a new idea for me also. But its applications are really, really amazing. And uh, I, I think we should uh, re really attempt on small scale projects that can show the benefits and can really uh, scale it up for uh, betterment of the country as uh, engineers or technologists. We are, our duty is to adopt technology to transform or change the world. And the two talks today made really made a great impact. I, I was amazed by every idea the speaker was talking about and how it could be. It's, it's not just a dream idea. It was really tried out. And he knows the ins and out of all the consequences of these ideas, how it can be translated and uh, you can create a new world. Thank you very much, uh, both uh, Walter and uh, Katharina for uh, the, the most brilliant talk. And I will join after the discussion from our participants. I'm sure this has a tremendous impact, is going to have a tremendous impact on our life, our society. And I wait for questions from our learned participants. And after that, I will conclude the session. Uh, can you, can you? Look at the chat box and see whether there are already some questions. Okay.
Okay, there are some questions which I can read out, and uh, Walter or Katrina can answer. I would this like question. to just, uh, you know, I, I was the, I mean, I, I have written three questions. I would like to ask that question particularly in light of the work that uh, was done jointly by uh, Walter Donner and uh, Unido. Uh, it was done in Tanzania and in Kenya. Uh, in the in the presentation of Katharina, you had suggested uh, that uh, uh, there should be two hydrolysis tanks uh, before the methanization process uh, starts. Uh, in the models that were implemented in East Africa in the early 2000s, like 2005, 2006, we had only one hydrolysis tank. So my question is whether this two uh, hydrolysis tanks, whether it is an improvement of the Rotaler model or is it just two separate tanks? Um, it is an improvement of the Rotaler model. Uh, and the... Okay, one moment. Um, what we've seen is that if you have just one tank, you the the really important thing is that the uh, feedstock, the fresh feedstock, is hydrolyzed and that the acidification takes place um, so roughly. And the problem is when you have just one um, tank, then feed, fresh feedstock goes in. And simultaneously, you take from this tank uh, material to put into the di digester, and then you get like shortcuts, where you get like fresh material, which is not yet hydrolyzed properly, uh, into your digester. So in, in bigger plants, the, if you have only one hydrolysis, it becomes, after a while, uh, a digester. So basically it becomes a PIP, as I said before. So um, there is, the biology will adapt and the, the advantage you have with two hydrolysis tanks is that you have, uh, that you can control it really easy. With one, it's basically not controllable because you cannot uh, make sure that your fresh material that goes into this one tank really stays there and is hydrolyzed properly instead of going directly into the digester. And then it just becomes like a bit uncontrolled again, and then it becomes a digester after a while. Because also hydrolysis bacteria adapt. Okay, thank you. That's good. Welcome. Mm -hmm. Yannan Panikar wanted to ask something. Dr. Panikar? Thank you. I have written two, uh, one question basically. Uh, I certainly enjoyed uh, Katharina's uh, talk, um, particularly the emphasis on uh, uh, the operational part, op OPEX versus CAPEX. That's wonderful. It's great. I have had bad experience with the CapEx uh, <laughs> preference and uh, I know it very well now. You have done a very good job in explaining it. Uh, my question is basically directed to Walter uh, Dana. Uh, we in Kutnat face a serious problem of infestation of uh, water hyacinths, Eukarnia crisipus. Of course, the Salvinia molesta, the African pile, is uh, no longer a big problem. But the water hyacinth is a big problem. Uh, water, uh, water channels are clogged up, and it's a very serious problem. We have uh, been considering, uh, in our work, we have been considering ways of uh, utilizing it. Of course, uh, in SD College, Alapi, Dr. Nagindra Prabhu is doing a wonderful job in utilizing them, utilizing water hyacinth, making products out of it. Uh, but the point that you have raised, this biochar idea, is wonderful because uh, we previously also to for carbon sequestration, car biochar was the uh, suggestion from the West. Uh, I, at that time, I had been thinking that is really not a very important thing in India, that just the carbon sequestration without any use of the char, the, just uh, put it under, under the soil. That's, uh, now you have come up with a way which is acceptable, more acceptable. 
in your case you what you are what you have suggested is that biochar is a very valuable product that can be utilized in farming that's great now question is how can we collect large amounts of uh, 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 eukarya hypercrisper that is a water hyacinth uh, that is spread all over the water bodies of kutanad and then how do we make the char out of it if we can solve that problem then uh, here is a great area for you to contribute do you have any suggestions yes so to make the biochar is not difficult as you said it's the the main thing is how to weed or harvest it and we have thought about it i saw rachif my spiritual brother and is here too hey rachif unmute ah hi hi yeah we are working we are thinking about how to implement this in uh uh in india yeah. we are not it's far and always we are a little bit stopped with this and uh i invited him for this session that he knows what i'm doing here beside this so and so we have the same teacher this is our how to say our cross point and uh, uh he has the same beard <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> what we do is now we are uh, we are looking into uh solutions uh, how to start it so what we did uh why we do it on a very small scale and uh and the reason is we do it in africa and uh, as vkd and uh and alex no i'm always a little bit scared of corruption in africa when we do it on bigger scale yeah unitani is smiling <laughs> you know what we, we yeah i i'm working with unitan for a long time and he served me when we were on the uh let's say on the on the airport in trivandrum and everything and yeah it was a great time but the thing is i made it very small that we are under the radar of the politicians and uh this is the reason why i i built this very small kiln or net uh kiln from from uh, used oil drums and uh, and then everyone can build and start so when we build a peak for instance in ethiopia there was the question on lake tana where the blue nile comes out so uh, then when we build for 1 million euro uh, a peak plant then we have to hire people immediately then we have to how to say the open hands or the open palm of the politicians and then it collapses what we do is we give the people the the know how to do it the my intention is to create prosperity for the poor and then selling in our case the the the, the carbon credits the, the volunteers carbon credits and this is what we do it's difficult to do it in germany but we have started and uh, now what we do is i can send you all uh, things our program we start the program of backyard gardening for the poor people who have a very small plot or even no no field only the a place with concrete floor to use it and uh, everyone can harvest the water hyacinths dry them and then there are other people who have money they go to the to the garden centers one example from lagos nigeria there is a guy peter bese did it now uh, a lady uh, sandra didi she is a garden center and that she bought the water hyacinth biochar from peter and sold it to the to the people 
They have gardens, pots, everything. And he said, hey, he's a lousy guy. And that's why he didn't work. He doesn't deliver. So she called me and said, hey, Walter, can I produce my bio job by my own? I said, sure. You hire someone who has no work, who is idle in the street, take it out, dry it, and, and build a, a kiln. The kiln is already built. Now we do a, a, a series of photographs to educate them how to do it. And it's true. The point is you, you learn this carbonization of water hyacinth within one morning. From eight to 12, you are able to do it. This is what we made it. I want to make the, the poor, I want to empower the poor. And this is an answer to Alex's question, industrial style. So, and the poor can maybe sell it to Rajiv or to another one. And he sells the water hyacinth biochar in a bigger bulk to the farmers or else. So the reason for the poor people to take the water hyacinth out of the creek or the river or the pond or the water reservoir is because in the, in the first step they have work, in the second harvesting, drying is work, carbonization is work, but on the fourth step there's income. I calculated it with, with one, uh, not with, with the Indian price conditions, but this is not so different to Africa. So within one week of work, you have enough water hyacinth taken out, taken out of the water body to dry it. And drying takes around two weeks, sun drying. And then let's say in, in total, you add up the work, it's, it's one week work, five days. You can make your income in Africa, because the income in Africa is 30, 50 euros per, per month. But you can have it with 100 euros. And even if you, they have kids, boys, boys idle around in the street, everything, you know, they are 10, 8, 10, 12 years old, they can do it. I have pictures, we did it. A nine-year-old boy at Lake Tana. He was uh, the son of uh, a cattle farmer on the pastures. He was the herder. Came there after one hot morning, or in the morning he was in school. It was in the afternoon. He was able to run the kiln, to operate the kiln. And, and that's it. So when we have maybe in your place, 50 families doing this, and then they sell it to one place. Then this is the industrial, not production, Alexander, it's the industrial collection and the industrial sales. I know you have an NGO, Alex, but I don't want to donate to countries where they have uh, uh, rockets and science uh, because you have enough money. But what I do is, I want to empower people to make their own living, a decent living. That's it. So, and this is, this is how Rajiv and me, we want to organize it. And we are stopped by the COVID and we are stopped by this and this. It's always the same, you know, same story. And I have a company to run. So what I, this uh, work with the water hyacinth is my NGO work. We developed an NGO. And, and that's it. And on the other side, Rajiv starts to investigate or has investigated, and that's it. So, and there is room. Uh, you, you should talk to Rajiv because he is an Indian. I'm sitting in Bavaria. Yes. I'm happy about every person who is, comes out of poverty anyway, but with such a system that this, 
you, you got my philosophy, huh? I was asked, hey, Walter, can you do it? Because we have a big foundation or uh, in, uh, uh, how to say, in, uh, from the US, they have the billionaires and all of this. I said, no, I don't want to have the billionaires. I want to have the, the people empowered. This is what my teacher tells me, help the people, not make you richer as you are. Rich is okay, but. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Walter, for that. I, yeah. I just wanted to know whether George Matthew, whom you met in Kochi during our long visit, uh, uh, is uh, currently in Vietnam. Uh, George Matthew, are you online? Yeah, I think he's, he's here. He man, solar and clean. So can you, do you want to put any questions to Walter and Katharina? He has been trying high performance uh, biogas plants here with, the, with our old design. Uh, George is here, yes. He has to unmute. George? Has he? It's so crowd, I don't know. Alexander Burgess, ah. I two more questions. I, I don't know if he's okay. answered. He's happy with the answers or he wants some more clarifications on his questions. No, basically, yeah, my, my uh, question was uh, um, the social and cultural backgrounds that uh, Walter describes uh, about Africa is much different than what we have in India, particularly in Kerala. So I think we need to and somehow I... take those into consideration as well. But my, my concern is that uh, the proposal uh, made by Walter in using biochar for our agriculture is certainly a great uh, boon, would be a great boon for uh, our farming uh, industry. And so uh, we need to somehow find ways and means to uh, to, to create or to produce biochar at an industrial scale, which would be profitable for the producer. And at the same time, it should not be a, a tremendous burden on the farmers who would uh, eventually use it as well. So one question would be, what percentage of the investment of a regular farmer, or for that matter, for one crop, what additional uh, funding would be required in order to replenish uh, the earth with uh, biochar for a hectare. Uh, if, uh, you know, take for example, Indian conditions or uh, particularly Kerala conditions. But if a person would invest something to the tune of about uh, 40,000 or 50,000 rupees, say for example, I'm, I'm just blindly guessing, what additional funds would be required for that person to use biochar also into the farming such that uh, it becomes uh, an asset for future uh, cultivation as well. Yeah, before answering that, may I ask uh, Mr. Rajiv Raman to make his point of how he has been able to start the work there. Okay. Be an uh, good evening to all. Uh, in fact, uh, I have been working on this after, as uh, Mr. Walter said, uh, we have been very close and intimate on certain, uh, he's my spiritual brother. So um, we, I have envisaged a certain program taking into challenges of all the ministerial, uh, political uh, circumstances and uh, you know various input into the finances, things like that. And the collection of hyacinth, how it can be collected, what has been done. I have done a massive study on this. Uh, I can uh, contribute on that uh, with uh, on a common platform, wherein uh, what uh, what are the means and ways to uh, do this particular performance? Uh, you know, overcoming all the challenges uh, that we have, especially uh, in Kerala, because I am basically from Kerala, so I know exactly what what all the circumstances and uh, situations are. So I, I can I will share it to you uh, later on a later platform once it is uh, formalized. We can have a separate talk on that, but that's right. Yeah. I can do a presentation. I've already made a presentation, so I can do a presentation on a, the subject once we progress on uh, certain things. Uh, so I am discussing it with Walter. Once we have finalized, then I can come back to you and make the presentation. So we can jointly work together on enhancing 
in developing this particular concept in all over Kerala. Okay. There are two questions from Professor Ravindranathan. One is uh, an excellent and very received, uh, especially in Kerala, relevant. Apart from maize, what are the other crops which can be used to get by char? Uh, okay. So, uh, yeah, the maize or yeah, what you can use is just the fronds of the coconut palms and uh, every, nearly every type of, of wheat uh, of the, but as long as it's dry. And I think from the, the coconut trees from time to time, some fronds have to be cut because they are they're dry. Instead of throwing it away, it makes sense to make biochar. And, and that, so I was many times in, in Kerala, and, but I'm not, I'm not so familiar with it as you are, because when mm -hmm. you go on the road, you, you see everything. So my main uh, feedstock is the, how to say, is the water hyacinth, because this is a, a problem I knew it since in all the tropical and subtropical areas or, or water bodies. That, that, that's it, yes. And uh, in uh, Tamil Nadu, there is, in the drier areas, there's a wheat. They use it for uh, charcoal production. And, uh, but even when the charcoal is sold, there's left a lot of powder unused. You can use it, you can buy it. In Ghana, my friend Felix buys it with all transportation costs with 40 euro cent per, per kilogram, means per ton. This is from ton 40 euro per ton, but this is just boost uh, 40 euro. This would be, let's say uh, 25 to 50 backyard gardens. You bring in this case uh, up to 50 families who have no, not the big income, out of or into food security and into prosperity. But they are, they must want to work. That's it. This is another thing, yes, that, that's it. So uh, finally, more or less you can use everything. Yeah, for the uh, rice straw. In many areas, they burn the rice straw. We are discussing in Pancha projects to digest rice straw because uh, they burn it on hectares and square kilometers. But rice straw, when it is dry, is a perfect soil enhancer biochar. And the, the, the biochar of straw, whether this is rice or wheat straw, uh, doesn't matter, is better, has better results in research on, on uh, yield increasing than biochar from wood. Rice straw is the perf is the perfect feedstock for a, for a carbonizer to produce biochar instead of burning. Mm -hmm. Dr. Ravindranath continues, in Northern India, mice is available in large quantities. In the context of Kerala, we are rich in the rice and other similar agricultural waste. So accordingly to Dr. Walter, which, which is the most appropriate bio waste in Kerala? Mm. Yeah, the, yeah. The, what I see is in the, it, yeah, when, what is available is available, I always say. And in this case, it, there's a lot of rice straw and uh, both. You can produce from rice straw, biogas, and in the north we talk about CNG projects, and uh, or produce char, biochar. Yeah, that's it. Both. So, yes, I I am not uh, aware. I don't know, Alex. Do you do you know of other other feedstocks we discussed in the past? 
uh, we have municipal solid waste, yes, but this is another case. But uh, but rice straw, yeah, it's it's available. At the moment, I think rice straw is one of the plentifully av available uh, uh, feedstock for producing biochar in Kerala. Taking Kerala's example, I think that is that is the best. I believe. Mm -hmm. Engineer K.P. Harigumar complimented the talk. is uh, very relevant for our country and uh, happy about the knowledge he received from the talk. Any more questions uh, from participants? Before... Uh, May I have a follow-up? May I have a follow-up? Yes, yes. Uh, I would like to follow up because I'm very serious about this issue here in Kutnaad. The question is collection and mm. making biochar. Mm. Uh, if there are technologies available, which we are not aware of, we are trying to develop our own technology at the moment. Uh, we would be very, if anybody in this group, whether Raja, Rajiv Raman or, uh, or yep. anybody else has anything to contribute in this field, how do we collect large amounts of uh, Eucarnia hypercipus, that is water hyacinths, uh, from the large water bodies and bring it to the shore and then make uh, biochar where there is a scarcity of space? Uh, we can have a, a particular sub, uh, you know, there are challenges, but uh, we can discuss on this subject later because I have, uh, you know, there it is not only one solution. There are uh, different solutions that can be, I have looked into. So we can discuss on this. Some of them can be made viable uh, on panjayat basis. So uh, I have uh, segregated uh, different panjayats. So we can discuss on this. Maybe we can Mutually, when we discuss, uh, you know, other things will come out of it. So I will, uh, we can uh, mutually discuss on that. Uh, is there a contact? Yeah, I, I, yes, uh, Walter can give you my contact or we oh, can. You can, you can type it in the, in the chat, Rajiv. Yeah, let me do that. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, also Professor like, Mohammed uh, Kasim has uh, complimented the talk. Is the vice chair of the ITP Kerala section? Yeah, let's continue, sir. Yeah, I, I would like to just make one suggestion. Over a period of about ten to fifteen years, uh, both Professor Damodaran and uh, Walter and Daresh and Unitan and me, we have tried to set up a model biogas plant using this high performance uh, 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 temperature controlled digester technology in some part of Trivandrum uh, so that people could take, uh, you know, uh, um, get some understanding about the effectiveness of using waste as a means to create energy. However, I should admit uh, that, uh, you know, during my working life in UNIDO, I was not able to implement that. But I would uh, certainly recommend your chapter to take up this uh, challenge and set up a model uh, digester somewhere where food waste or uh, vegetable waste is uh, plentifully available and uh, let people in uh, various uh, municipalities or panchayats come and see because this uh, technology can be replicated uh, very easily throughout Kerala because there is a lot of agro waste, food waste available. So uh, if this is one way of promoting uh, the use of biogas, I think it would certainly help our economy as well. So uh, we couldn't really find a good sponsor uh, to, to provide us the land and also uh, help us with setting up the infrastructure. That is what we could not accomplish. So I would uh, certainly request this chapter to somehow take it up and see whether something like that can be accomplished. Thank you. Uh, Alex, so that's a wonderful suggestion. And uh, that particular experiment that you were telling, we try to do with George Matthew in the team sustain. But unfortunately, our uh, that young man who came to Africa, what is that, Ajay, Ajay, Ajay or somebody, 
uh, he he had to leave the company because of personal problems but now i think the coconut front which walter mentioned because we have enough and more of that here throughout kerala right from southernmost tip to the north so we will have to actually conduct a kind of a feasibility study and also we will have to with the help of walter and uh, katharina and also rajiv we will have to actually kind of work out something and let me talk to the the chair or the executive vice president of uh, science and technology council here uh, uh, in the committee and uh, we might probably get some kind of a support from there uh, for conducting a preliminary experiment and having a model plant not a big size but a small size just to assess the viability and sometimes maybe as anand panikar said uh, kutnad or the kochin nearby areas could be good one for continued supply of uh, water hyacinth so all those things we can actually examine later but we will decide that the follow up thing will be to take it up as a project under the science and technology and environment council so that uh, i think this will be a good thing as uh, so here also pointed out uh, there are a lot of material for us to start thinking and also start working so let us do that and any other points otherwise we are already overshot the time so if there are any other questions please come around and just had one or two points before uh, handing over the mic to jo jidin for uh, vote of thanks now this uh, consultant network uh, ag is back with a big bang as you know this uh, consultant network is an affinity group of ieee which is free to all members of ieee and uh, as we all know ieee is engaged in knowledge business or management 30% of the world's technical literature is produced by ieee and consultant network is a tributary through which knowledge is can be shared or traded we have cost or with, with cost today we had uh, the fortune to listen to two resourceful and popular international award winning speakers walter and katherine dana from germany to enlighten us with brilliant ideas lot of food for thought i think now next step is to make some actionable plan to translate some of these ideas into reality so this is what we will be focusing uh, i invite jitin to give the vote of thanks this time hey, hello all uh, so it was a wonderful session and uh, i believe that everyone got a lot of new knowledge uh, from both of our speakers as well as all the discussions that happened over here and uh, for this even new opportunities in green energy biogas and beyond we had two presentations high performing economic and sustainable biogas power from waste by ms katharina dana as well as the second presentation boosting biogas and agriculture with biochar by engineer walter dana and we had we also had a fruitful session uh, and thank you to both the speakers okay. for having this wonderful session also all the participants uh, who mm. participated with the uh, in the discussion and shared their uh, and, uh, shared their contribution of experiences as well as knowledge also i thank the uh, executive committee members of uh, ieee consultant network uh, vice chair uh, mr suhir sir and also the prof uh, chairman uh, professor v k d sir uh, for taking the initiative for conducting such a uh, big event that has created some considerable uh, attention to our cons consultants network uh, also uh, i thank all other participants who are here uh, and made our event a successful one thank you very much thank you thank you very much yeah uh, thank, thank you very, you very much, much. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Yeah, we really enjoyed. We really enjoyed yeah. the session. <laughs> we'll be in touch with Rajiv. Yeah, we will definitely. I have sent the mail ID. So good. Thank you. Yeah.
okay uh, so yeah. i'll be sending the youtube recording links to all of you those who attended so you, you can refer that after this event okay thank you thanks thank you very much for uh, remaining with us next talk is us that is on uh, how to be a consultant with the un organizations what 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 considerations actually go uh, that will be a, a solo lecture by you with some discussions and only thing is we will have to fix the date and the next one will be on from world bank uh, dr sajida uh, she is actually principal advisor to the education group there in the nanam work uh, mostly in africa and other places so we will ask her also how to utilize the platform of uh, world bank for uh, professionals to be a consultant uh, and working so like that so we will gradually build this and uh, talk by kem nayar from australia uh, is also scheduled for august so we will have in the coming weeks a number of such useful talks and uh, on my own behalf let me thank all of you for participating and uh, hanging on till the end and with a very vibrant questions and very attentive time spent thank you very much and good night thank you very much to all got it thank you sir thank you thank you thank you very much sir thank you katherine thank you walter for your valuable time you enjoyed really yes 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 i am i am seeing you professor mary 15 years ago <laughs> so keep in touch and uh, now he is having his long beard at that time he was a very handsome person it could be you still the same walter don't worry <laughs> okay yes Sir, okay. okay. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Thank you. Alexander Vargas, sir. I actually I have not met you so far. I heard about you from Vikas, sir. Ah, uh, well, you see, uh, um, I have also heard about you, Doctor Ratna Kumar, yes, and yes. Uh, you know, it is always a pleasure to uh, interact. In, you know, when I come to Trivandrum next time, I hope to come and see you as well. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, and also you. mr panikar uh, uh, next time i'm traveling through kutnad i would certainly like to come and uh, visit you as well alex now yes. kumar is actually officiating as the director of the asian school of uh, uh, business here in trivandrum okay ha uh ha -huh. okay okay alexander vargis i am in trivandrum uh, although i work i work in kutnad uh, in a uh, well, yes. in an online fashion very very actively but i stay in kutnad because of the lockdown and uh, i'm locked down here uh, yeah. yeah in fact uh, you know one of my constant companions for dinner in trivandrum is professor vkd so that is where i think you know he brings out wonderful ideas so uh, i think uh, that could be used as an incubator for bringing in such kind of ideas <laughs> next time when we uh, have an opportunity uh, to be in trivandrum uh, professor panikar dr panikar can also join us and maybe we can brainstorm uh, ways and means to uh, bring this biochar thing to kerala wonderful mm. good Nice Murli Mohanlal sir, Murli Mohanlal sir, quiet. Your oh. sound is not heard. Where are you? All along, been very silent, quiet. So, okay. I wish you all a nice evening, and uh, thank you. We thank see you. See each other soon. Thank you. Yeah. See you. See you. Okay. Next you. meeting. Bye bye. Okay. Thank you all. Bye.